Pavlos Holman. So he's going to talk about the lie about 3D printing and the bullshit around it. And apparently he's going to share a weird trick. So, Pavlos, stage is yours. So, I'm, I work in a big lab uh, called the Intellectual Ventures Lab. And we basically just bought one of every tool in the world and hired one of every kind of scientist and then started setting out to try and invent new technologies. Um, we like to think that we're you know, solving big problems, but half the time we're probably just inventing things that will end up in the last speaker's next talk. <laughs> um, but it's a way to cheat at invention because a lot of what you need to be able to do is you know, go through a lot of ideas and throw out a lot of them. We need to be able to test things and prove that they're going to work or not going to work. And this, you know, this is a pretty large scale um, operation and it's made us the biggest patent filers in America most years. Um, and it's because we don't make products or anything. We're really just trying to invent wherever we can. So I've been working on 3D printing for a long time and I want to talk a little bit about, about that and where I see some of the potential. Um, here's how things are made. This is a machine we have in the lab called the vertical mill. This is how we've been making things for the last century. Um, the way that machine works, you mount a block of metal in there. It's got a spinning tool that can cut through metal, spins at 10,000 RPM. And then the bed moves in three axes to move that block of metal around the tool. That's how you cut the mold to inject the plastic to make your car parts and cell phones and things. And this is an example of what a mold looks like. It's a block of metal. It's been machined out. And it costs, you know, 50 grand to make a mold like this. And you need a very experienced machinist to spend a bunch of time if he screws it up and cuts in the wrong spot, the mold's ruined and you have to start over. And um, this is the sort of key fundamental thing associated with economies of scale. Because once you make that mold and you spend 50 grand on it, you're going to amortize the cost of it over hundreds of thousands of units. You're going to use that mold almost, you know, hundreds of thousands of times to get your money back. And when you're making things that way, it's limiting in a sense. You have to design a product. You have to know exactly what product you're going to make. You have to decide years in advance, usually 18 months in advance uh, is the product cycle for a typical product. You have to know how many you're going to make so you can make a mold that can handle being um, injected that many times. That mold goes in a machine like this and then uh, this is the machine that's going to compress hot, melted plastic into it uh, like this. These little plastic pellets go in there. They get melted, they get injected into the mold, and then you cool it down and do it again. And you do it over and over and over again. That's how all your stuff is made. And because you make things that way, you have to know in advance everything about it. Um, this is really bizarre. The thing takes like a minute to click. So I'm a minute behind on my presentation. And in the end, if you couldn't guess, that's what we're trying to make. Okay, so I'm just going to keep clicking. You guys have seen robots like this. This is a maker bot. This is one I worked on. What we tried to do was take these, you know, object machines that you saw in one of the previous talks that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, I have machines like that in the lab. And we tried to take that and turn it into something that cost a couple grand you could put on your desktop. That's what a maker bot is. And, and they're the first, you know, kind of consumer grade 3D printer. You can buy one of these, stick it in your house, stick it in your school. My daughter was printing high heeled shoes for herself when she was six years old on our dining room table. Um, they're very accessible. And kids, if you, you know, use World of Warcraft or SketchUp or whatever, you can design stuff that can be printed this way. And what's cool about it is it changes your perspective on how things are made. Kids grow up in 3D environments in their video games, and they grow up using MakerBots. And they don't grow up with milling machines, and they don't grow up with the same 
you know, kinds of experiences you and I had crawling under a Volkswagen Beetle trying to, you know, swap out the engine or something, right? That's the way that things are built is different now. And what I think a lot of people have misunderstood about 3D printing, we've all heard about it, read about it, you know, the president says it's the future of American manufacturing, all this kind of stuff. We think it's about additive manufacturing because a 3D printer takes material and puts down just what you need instead of cutting away all the stuff that you don't need, which is really cool and that's different and that's not how other things are made. But the key thing about a 3D printer has nothing to do with being additive. The key thing about a 3D printer is that it's programmable and it doesn't care if it ever makes the same thing twice, right? Because I can just draw something on a computer, click print, and it'll go make it for me. And if I don't like it, or it's the wrong size, or it's the wrong color, or I need to change one little detail, that's no problem at all. I just change it in my drawing, click print, and it'll go make me a new one. And that's the amazing and powerful thing that a 3D printer exemplifies because it changes the way that our product development cycle works. We can iterate. So um, I started working on 3D printing quite a long time ago um, because I was early to it, you know, and because I'm an inventor, instead of working on, uh, you know, looking at an industry like 3D printing where I can sort of imagine what they're working on. You know, if I look at Objet or Stratasys or 3D Systems, I'm going to try and guess what is it that they want to do. And they're going to, you know, probably be trying to invent faster 3D printers. Can you advance the slide for me? Bigger 3D printers, 3D printers that support more materials. Those are all obvious targets. That's what they're busy inventing. So I don't work on that. I look five or ten years in the future. If they had all those things, then what would you want? And that's what I try to invent. And that's a way of moving technology more quickly. One of the crazy things I'm known for is inventing machines that can print food, which is a totally uh, red herring idea that hopefully will someday feature in a Kickstarter video that you guys can laugh at. <laughs> it's okay. Everyone thinks I'm crazy, and that's just fine. But imagine if you had a machine like that with toner cartridges of you know frozen or dried and powdered foods and the print head would put down a pixel of food, hydrate it with a needle, zap it with a laser to cook it, rinse and repeat for every pixel and it prints a meal that's customized for you. And it avoids your allergens and dietary restrictions and injects your pharmaceuticals, right? The way you eat right now is like a caveman. You just look around, find something that looks yummy, cram it in your mouth, and there's no correlation to health effects. And you know, in the long run, I, well, I died, but you know, who knows why, right? So if we actually knew what you ate, and we could track that and correlate it to health effects and make meals that were customized for you, then we'd be able to actually use that data and improve your diet. And we also need to find more efficient ways to feed people, which is you know, an interesting problem since here we basically throw out 40% of our food before we ever even eat it. And, you know, we get away with it because we're rich, but there's a lot of people in the world who are trying to eat more and more like we do. And that's not working out because we're not very good role models. So if you had machines that could make a custom meal, that'd be pretty interesting. This is a uh, diversion. I, yeah. So, it's fun to make fun of other industries, so I started looking at what else can we do with 3D printers. This is how we, spun, this is a yarn spinning operation in America 100 years ago. Um, this is how we do it today. We don't do it in America anymore. Do it in Indonesia, for example. Uh, it's improved a lot. You can see that they have particulate filters now, so it's better. Um, same sort of thing applies. Uh, this is a sewing operation in America 100 years ago. Now we do it in Bangladesh with a particulate filter. So, you know, things are improving. Not a whole lot of change, right? Those machines haven't even changed much. This is what happens to factories in Bangladesh. Uh, we're basically just 
moving manufacturing to wherever the lowest cost labor on planet Earth is. And so, um, you know, we don't have the same kinds of, you know, protections in how we do labor and build buildings and manage factories and things like that. If you think about how your clothes are made right now, um, something like a, as simple as a t-shirt, the cotton's grown in one country, shipped to another country to be beaten down and bleached out, shipped to another country to be spun into yarn, shipped to another country to be knit or woven into fabrics, shipped to another country to be sewn into t-shirts before we ship it back to America and print team building exercise 1999 on it and you know stick it in the bottom of your closet, right? So it's wildly inefficient the way that we make clothes. And a lot of that has to do with the, you know, different pieces of the industry being broken up into different businesses. And a lot of it's about chasing that low cost labor, right? Um, turns out when you have a complicated mess like that, there's room for improvement. Also your clothes, you know, you're being told that you're a unique and special snowflake, but really you're just a small, medium or large snowflake, right? Because we don't have a way of making clothes for you, we just have to make clothes for lowest common denominators and we hope that you map to one of them. Meanwhile, we get it wrong. We have to guess about what designs to make. Uh, whoops, back up one. So, you know, when we're having something like the Super Bowl, we make a whole bunch of shirts. Can you back up one slide for me? For the winning team and for the losing team. And whichever one wins, we sell those shirts, the ones that lose. We ship them to South Africa. <laughs> Donate, there's a charitable donation. If you go to South Africa, you have a wildly skewed perspective on American football, <laughs> right? Because we don't, we have to guess. And that go, goes back to that economies of scale thing, right? Um, you can now advance. If you're a fashion designer or apparel designer, things aren't any better for you. You basically have to come up with an idea, um, make one, stick it on the runway, uh, hope somebody orders it for their store, then you send it via fax machine to China, <laughs> um, wait six to nine months for it to come back, and then it goes on the shelf, you hope that people buy it, and you hope that you guessed right about what size, what color, which designs, and the volumes for each. Because if you get it wrong, then um, the store sends it back to you. <laughs> if you got it right and it sells out too fast, then it's too late to get more. So there's a lot of guesswork in there. And if it all sells perfectly, then you get paid 90 days later. It's not very good for fashion designers. So think about this. Back in the 80s, here's how we made software. I dream up some idea, I roll out of bed, I write some code for like a year, and then it goes on a floppy disk in a shrink-wrapped box on the shelf at the computer store, and I wait for you to buy it. Inside the box is a postcard where you can file bugs. You can write bugs on the postcard and mail them into Microsoft or Apple. This is ha actually how it worked. So think about how we write software today. I dream something up, I roll out of bed, I write some code, and I launch it at lunchtime. People are emailing me all afternoon, pissed off that it doesn't work, filing bugs. <laughs> I write a new version, launch it at dinner time. This is normal. That's your web apps, that's your mobile apps, that's how everything is made today. And that's what we mean when we say rapid iteration, right? And what's amazing about that is it means you don't have to be so smart. You don't have to know 18 months in advance what's going to sell. You can hire dumb shits to write software because they don't have to know anything. All they're going to do is launch something, A, B, test it, see what works, and steer towards what's successful. That's what's going on with your web apps and your mobile apps, and in some sense what's going on with Kickstarter and things like that, right? It's rapid iteration, and it helps us to steer towards new things, figure out what works, address what works in the market, and it's worked so well in software that we're trying to do that for everything else in the world. 
right? We're trying to do that with electronics. You used to have like a, a chip guy and a firmware guy and a guy who could, you know, like solder shit, all that to make gadgets. Forget it. Now you just get an Arduino, plug it in, and it turns everything that was electronics into software. That's why you're seeing all those gadgets on Kickstarter, because they basically solved the problem of making gadgets the way we make software. But right now, we still haven't solved this problem for how we make physical stuff. And that's what 3D printing affects in our minds. We imagine this magical factory in the future where you're gonna be able to click buy now, robots will make your stuff and drop it in the mail. I like to collect these new superpowers when new technologies come along. Check this out. This is basically CAD software for clothes. You can draw something on a computer screen, adjust every little dimension, see what it's gonna look like on the body, bam. That's amazing, right? This is just video game technology being repurposed. But you get that in your mind and you start thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe I could take the 18 month development cycle out of clothing, right? What if we could do that differently or better? And these technologies are the th types of things that you have to collect and cram in your head when you're an inventor, right? And then you try to find problems and stick them in the other side of your head. And there's a giant Rubik's cube in there that you use to match them up. And sometimes you get a hit. Here, watch this. Can you go to the next one? Uh, there's nobody running that sewing machine. That's the kind of superpower that we've never had before. There are no robotic sewing machines yet. But you see something like this, and you think, well, what are all those people in factories doing? Most of them are sewing, right? All those shitty factory dungeon jobs, child labor working for Nike, that's, that's sewing. And that's because it takes fingertips and stuff, but it doesn't require any miracles to do this. We have the ability to go design these machines now. So things are changing, and the potential is changing. I started this project, a company called Bombsheller, where we were playing with this idea, right? What would happen if we could make a product? I started in the same place that the, the former speaker did, where we thought, man, 3D printing has this potential to change the way we make things. What if we could reinvent how we make things? So at Bombsheller, you take an artist, anybody, could be you, makes a design, this guy's a painter, goes on a template on the computer, next thing you know, we're making clothes, right? This is how it operates, and there's no planning ahead. Watch this. There's a template, that's easy, you download it from the website. This is a map of like Seattle from 100 years ago. Um, you, you know, if you're a lazy artist like me, you just drag that on there, next thing you know, it's done. So that's uh, all there is to it. And you know, you guys can all do this tonight for fun. And you'll be able to make your own clothes. But the next, you know, we use 3D video game technology to see what it's gonna look like on the body before we ever make anything. This is rapid prototyping, right? And then the next thing, you know, we didn't know what city would be popular, so we just made them all. And, you know, dancers need leggings. We just do these graphic leggings right now. People working out need leggings. Um, it's rock climbers, uh, who knows, the roller derby runners. Everybody wears leggings for something. I don't even know what that is. Uh, you know, <laughs> yoga. But the interesting thing is all of those different People want something different, right? If you're into CrossFit, what you're excited about is probably different than yoga or roller derby, right? And if you're, you know, Zara, and you have to sell 100,000 of the same thing for it to be profitable, then you're not gonna make something just for the roller derby, right? Bombsheller can serve a niche market of one person and make the same amount of money as if they had 10,000 customers for the exact same thing. And that kind of 
potential exists in a lot of areas. There's another project I work on called Glowforge, where we tried to reinvent another type of tool, which is a laser cutter. So with a Glowforge, you just draw something on a computer, click print, and a laser will go cut it out of you know, whatever material you stick in there. It'll cut cardboard, but also cut plastic and things like that, um, wood. You don't have to learn how to use CAD. You just have to learn to operate a Sharpie because the machine has machine vision in it. And tools historically have never had that. This machine just looks everywhere the Sharpie is and it goes and etches over it. And if you want to make a bunch of them, it learned from that so it can just make more. And we need to reinvent our tools with the technologies that we have now. And that's really what I see that is valuable about 3D printing and about something like Glowforge is that we're reinventing these tools so they understand what they're doing. They're smart enough with the Glowforge, you don't have to align anything, you just throw something in there, it automatically figures out what it is it's working on, what material it is, how to align, what the focus level is, all these things that a machinist used to have to do. And we have a chance to do that for all of our tools and how we make things and that gives us a chance to reinvent how we make our businesses and the products from them. So thank you. <laughs>